on our report to the Commission. The first part uh, talks about five decades of uh, failed gun control, but I'm not going to cover that. As our Blake Brown has covered that, and he's done a good job of his historical perspective. But just in the intro, I'd like to add that of great concern to the NFA, we were concerned that this commission would be usurped by certain political and special interest groups who have attempted to portray this tragedy as a, both a gender-based issue and a reason for more gun control. We don't feel that way. We feel that at its core, this is about uh, the failure of the incident command system with police and the criminal intent of Mr. Wartman. Sorry, the perpetrator. I'll try not to use his name. Anyway, that's just an intro. So what I wish to do, if you can follow in your guide, is start off on page seven. And one thing I wanted to quickly talk about were st statistics. Canada's homicide rate actually peaked in 1974, about three years before the first big round of gun control, C-51. And one thing statisticians will say is you have to look at trends before any legislation is passed to see what was happening. And just on one side note, uh, we we're talking about non-firearms related incidents. I'm recalling the uh, incident at the Bluebird Cafe in the Wagon Wheel uh, Bar in Montreal in 1972 when three disgruntled, sorry, three intoxicated patrons were refused entrance. They returned with a canister of gasoline and lit the place on fire and killed 37 people using fuel and ignition as a weapon. And that's something that's often overlooked. Now, referring to a coal pump, I'm jumping around a bit here on my page seven, so please bear with me. I'm, I'm trying to, to repeat what Brown said. But as far as uh, dissonance or differing opinions, in the wake of Ecole Polytechnique in 1989, the investigating coroner, Dr. Therese Rue, wrote in her one-page conclusion on, in Chapter 3, the issue of firearms control has intentionally not been addressed. And she went on to state that the issues of police emergency response and pre-hospital care were matters worthy of their full attention. And at that time, Gamio Garbi, who was the uh, perpetrator of that, well, it was understood that his father was an Algerian national who was a misogynist of the first order, which in no way excuses what he did, but at least gives, gives some background. And years later, his mother would subsequently give an interview with the CBC and talk about that. And of course, since that time, since that time, of course, the events at the Cold Polytechnique have been used to uh, justify more control and exploit the deaths of 14 women. And I, and I understand that the family of Ellen Kogan have given an interview uh, with the CBC and talked about how much anger and sorrow this brings them as that open wound it fails to heal. And I'm moving along then. I want to go to page eight, please, and uh, mid-paragraph. In the, in the wake of C-68 and debate in the Senate after the bill's passing, another, uh, another senator who wasn't going along with this was Ann Cools, and she spoke eloquently against the bill and criticized the idea of a criminal penalty for not having a license simply to possess one's own property, which is what was brought in with that legislation. And she also took certain women's groups and others to task for attempting to treat gun ownership as a gender issue, as well as her frequently misrepresenting homicide stats and firearms use among domestic partners. The senator even quoted Blackstone, and her comments can be found online. I wish to jump ahead here, just for brevity. Excuse me. On page 10, I do reference Dr. John Lott and his website, uh, crimeresearch.org, and this is a very good website for dealing with the mythology of uh, the U.S., and I bring that into the, into the conversation because in Canada, you almost can't have a conversation about firearms without dragging the U.S. into it, and then you see the arguments about the Second Amendment and uh, some of the mythology we have in this, in this country. One shocking stat I'll uh, mention is that, and this was posted and updated in January 2016, that deaths from mass public shooting in Europe is essentially on par numerically when you compare those to the U.S., to, uh, to Europe as a whole or individual states. In fact, there are some states that haven't had mass shootings. And uh, murders in the U.S. are actually quite concentrated. 54% of counties in 2014 had zero murders. 2% of counties have 51%, and that was from April 2017. Now, the perpetrator, as we know, used police impersonation, which is itself a crime. Now, we have seen the passage of the Police Identity Management Act, but really that's little more than political expediency under the guise of public safety and a solution for looking for really what's a non-existent problem, given what we know was going on that night. And I'll jump ahead to page 12 and the release of the 9-11 tapes 
in uh, June of 2021 at the beginning of that situation illustrate that the authorities and persons under attack by a said perpetrator who realized that the attacker was illegally uh, uniformed and equipped. Okay, and of course we have the, also the ongoing allegations that uh, the perpetrator was a confidential informant with the RCMP, which we still can't confirm. And on that note, I would like to move on please to uh, Gary Mauser's uh, commentary on, on Blake Brown's report. And I'll just briefly sum a few points. <coughs> Excuse me. On page three, the most important omission of Professor Brown's submission was his failure to address the effectiveness of firearms legislation. And down at the bottom of the, of the page, Brown hasn't provided any evidence that any particular type of firearm, such as semi-automatic ones, pose any greater threat to public peace than any other. Moving to page four. Rampage killers aren't limited to using firearms to murder victims. We've heard Mr. Giltaka reference that, where lately people tend to use SUVs and drive on sidewalks, which can be quite successful. And uh, in the next paragraph, Brown notes there is no agreed definition of assault-style firearm. Indeed, that's more of a political term and encompassing cosmetics such as perhaps a pistol grip. But it has not, mentions nothing about the fire control portion, which I think on a 1907 Winchester semi-automatic is the same. And this is how long semi-automatics have been uh, in production. You know, Going down to the bottom of the page, toward in page four, if, if the government can confiscate property lawfully held and used by any group claimed to be suspect, then no one in Canada consider, can consider their property safe from arbitrary seizure. And Brown mentions this when he talks about the 19th and 20th centuries when uh, certain ethnic groups were looked upon that way and had property seized. Page five. Notably, Professor Brown didn't mention that the killer possessed his firearms illegally. Toward the bottom of page five, more than two million Canadians hold a possession and acquisition license, now called the PAL. Page six. According to StatsCan, the recent report to the House of Commons Standing Committee on Public Safety and National Security, PAL holders are accused of homicide about half as, as often as other adults. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, that is no endorsement of licensing. I don't support the concept of licensing, but it does illustrate the government is continually attacking the wrong people. On page seven, second paragraph, although Professor Blake Brown makes few comments about whether firearms restrictions are effective, he does cite supportive journalists and public health activists such as Simon Chapman, whose research has been thoroughly discredited, and that's EndNote 16. By ignoring studies by criminologists, medical doctors, and economists that employ more powerful research methods, Brown leaves a misleading implication that gun bans and arbitrary restrictions on firearms are an effective way to limit multiple victim homicides. Now on that note, <coughs> midway through the page, uh, he talks about the testimony of Dr. Kalen Langman. And on that note, I have uh, Dr. Langman's Mass Homicide by Firearm in Canada, Effects of Legislation. I wish to have Dr. Langman uh, subpoenaed so he can testify himself toward his work. He's unique in his approach to this, and to my knowledge, the only professional doing this sort of legislation, sorry, doing this sort of research in Canada. And he has published peer-reviewed research in the uh, Journal of Interpersonal Violence. And now I've left time open for any questions, that's why I wanted to abbreviate it. And uh, Sorry, um, no questions, Mr. Bracken. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your consideration.